welcome to the Art School Podcast. I'm Ken Goshen. Today's topic is a fascinating one, the death and life of painting. Painting has been proclaimed dead many times throughout history, and yet people like me, and probably like you, continue to sling paint around, still believing it matters. I'm sure you'll enjoy this true crime episode where we explore the alleged death scenes, victims, and perpetrators. I also had the opportunity to mount an impromptu Marxism-fueled postmodernist assault on classical art, which is always good fun. Stay tuned. And what a treat, ladies and gentlemen. Setting an art school record, the great Ilya Gefter is back on the podcast for the second episode in a row and third episode in total. I introduced Ilya when he first came on the show, which was episode eight. And from the feedback I've been getting about our most recent conversation, I suspect Ilya will soon need no introduction. Ilya came up with this conversation topic, and I'm so fortunate to be able to engage with his ideas and insights and bring them to you. So if you enjoy this episode and want us to do more of these, make sure you follow Ilya on Instagram at iliagefter.art and the rest of his social media pages, which I'll list in the show notes. Let him know you enjoyed his appearance on the show, and let's hope he comes back for more, as we'll all be the better for it. And if you want more of me, please visit patreon.com slash Ken Goshen and sign up as a patron. In the past, I used to say that this is how you'll be supporting the show. And then I would say that for my lessons, you can visit kengoshen.com slash lessons. These two links are now a distinction without a difference. Because thanks to all the people who became supporters, I was able to move my whole educational model to Patreon. This makes my lessons as affordable as can be and accessible to anyone who wants to learn all over the world. This past August, September, October, and November, my Patreon supporters have been getting four live painting lessons per month for the price of $2. That's a quarter per live painting lesson, where you get to watch me explain my every move and ask me any questions you want. A quarter. And supporters in the $10 level also get access to a video archive of past lessons. There's already 150 hours of video content and more videos are added every month. And all this is brought to you by the many supporters who signed up in August, September, October, and November, to whom I'm deeply, deeply grateful. I must tell you though, we are still far from making this operation sustainable. So hopefully more of you will join the team in December. The more people join my Patreon, the more I am able to devote time to producing this show and making it available for free please visit patreon.com slash Ken Goshen or kengoshen.com slash lessons and become a supporter. Thanks again to everyone who signed up. It's people like you who make all of this possible. And now I bring you my conversation with Ilya Gefter. Ilya, welcome back on the show. Glad to have you. Thank you so much for having me. Good to see you and hope to see you in person soon enough. Yeah, probably, probably end of December. Uh, so to everybody listening, Ilya suggested that we discuss uh, a topic that sounded really interesting to me, the death and life of painting. And I think the best place to start is perhaps tell us what you mean by death of painting. How could painting be dead or alive? Hmm. Um, well, it... Very good question, because we before before we discuss really grand statements, we have to uh, we have to uh, align ourselves with the terminology, and like we, we, we can say that a uh, that uh, our pet is dead, and we 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 uh, we understand exactly what we mean by that. Like the cat was alive, and now it's dead. Now, when when we are talking about something. Uh, as complex as painting, what and, and which is not animate, uh, one would claim. Uh, what what the hell do we mean by death? And I, I think uh, a paint, if if we treat painting as uh, an object, let's say like um, uh, like a telephone or like a, um, a picture on a wall, uh, like a photograph on a wall, or a computer, uh, or a rotary phone. Uh, we can say that painting is dead when it loses its relevance. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so uh, so uh, pa- uh, the death of painting was proclaimed on numerous occasions in the history of art in the last 180 years or, or so. Um, and uh, well, paintings are still uh, gracing museum walls. They are still uh, in some of our houses and galleries. So what did people mean by the death of painting when, it, when they proclaimed it? I think 
uh, they suggested that painting from now on is no longer relevant. Mm. Um, in the same way that uh, like, like a rotary phone, uh, it cannot die as an inanimate object, but it's completely irrelevant in our lives. Uh, so we can say, well, this piece of technology or this particular object is dead for us. Mm. So essentially you're, you're, you're saying that you're saying, which, which is, <laughs> which is how it actually was painting had a kind of golden age, a time in history when it was, you know, the highest form of art where everybody was basically infatuated with, with painting. And then it kind of started losing its uh, glory or losing its uh, panache. Uh, why would you say that started to happen? Well, uh, let me make a little correction. I'm not saying that. Ah, okay. Uh, but others, other, uh, others have said that. Um, Good on, correction. Uh, quite a few people on uh, quite a few occasions. Um, I'm not saying that painting is dead. Dead. This is not necessarily what I believe in, but I was very, very interested in the claim itself and um, why it was claimed and um, and and uh, uh, why it was uh, why why this claim was made on so many occasions over uh, quite a long stretch of time, quite a few generations. I think the uh, if 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 I remember my dates correctly, the first time the death of painting was proclaimed was around 1836. Um, uh, so uh, about 180 years ago, um, and um, once in a while, these proclamations are still being made. And then, okay, you, you do the math, and if if someone and if people are saying that something is dead uh, again and again and again over such a long stretch of time, well, uh, it's a good reason to to start scratching our heads and uh, think, well, maybe it's actually a sign of longevity. Mm. And so, if we continue with this analogy, when a doctor proclaims a person dead, you know, they check the pulse, they check the breath, they check for some evidence of death. What were the evidence that were cited by these people who made these proclamations? Perhaps you can start with the earlier proclamations and give us those signs that basically told these people, okay, there's something to be worried about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know if there, if we can find actual evidence to support the claim that painting has died, but there were numerous reasons for this proclamation to be made. Uh, the first one was the invention of photography in, mm. uh, in, um, uh, in the uh, first half of the uh, 19th century. So uh, and, uh, like these, these were very, very early um, forms of photography like um, daguerreotype and, so, and, and some other, uh, other types of uh, technologies. And uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, critics uh, cultural critics uh, discovered this new technology. They looked at uh, these wonderful, miraculous new objects. Uh, for example, the daguerreotypes, which you know, I find them to be absolutely marvelous, incredibly beautiful. Um, and uh, they do things that uh, rather easily, comparatively speaking, in an inexpensive way, uh, which painting has been trying to do, and they do it cheaper, they do it better, and so forth and so on. So let's say if, if uh, a um, portrait painter uh, in the 19th century was aiming to uh, make the most uh, li um, lifelike portrait uh, the, or the most detailed portrait, then um, yes, the, the, uh, those daguerreotypes uh, raise a big question mark. Well, here's a new technology in town, um, what's the point of, uh, of making a painting? Mm. Um, so so, so, so uh, it's, it's, not, it's not like there is, uh, there is a factual evidence to say painting is dead, but there are a bunch of challenges for, the painting, for paintings to continue their existence in uh, a certain form that they developed over time. Mm. And uh, this change is quite evident, or this the, 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 the seriousness of this challenge is quite evident because there are far less portrait painters nowadays, and it's not such a hot business to be engaged in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for, uh, 
for people listening, uh, I think all of us uh, don't spend enough time thinking what it must have been like to live in a world that isn't saturated with photographic images. Uh, we were all kind of used to living in a world where capturing somebody's likeness uh, for posterity is an easy and banal affair. You take a simple machine that all of us uh, carry in our pockets and, and reproducing images is, uh, is something that we're all just used to doing. But in the past, this was considered a kind of magical ability. There is, uh, I don't know if you watched the show uh, Medici on, uh, on Netflix. Have you watched it? I may have. A, I don't quite remember any details. Yes, I think I, 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 I may have. Yes, but, there's, uh, a, uh, there's a beautiful moment there in season two where uh, Botticelli is painting, to, is, is painting a, a girl that he's infatuated with, a woman that he's infatuated with, and he tells her that by painting her, he will save her from the ravages of time. He will immor <laughs> immortalize her. He will liberate her. her. Her image will remain young forever. And of course, that lady finds that idea ever so compelling. And today, I can't make that case. If I want somebody to sit for me, I can't tell them, you know, I'm going to immortalize them. You know, they can be immortalized with a selfie at any given moment. So what kind of shock to the system do you think that must have been uh, for painters who are engaged in this practice? Uh, well, uh... I, I, I do remember this episode. Uh, I, I, ha I have seen the uh, uh, I have seen the uh, series. Um, well, I'm not, I'm not quite sure that the selfies really do immortalize us. Um, a, and I, I, uh, one can also make uh, a claim that uh, an uninteresting portrait painting. Uh, dies even quicker than the person it's painted from like if 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 the if the if the painting is not particularly interesting to look at well uh maybe uh, may, maybe and uh, maybe maybe it, uh, maybe it's it's uh it, it it will be dated before the person dies so you kind of it, it takes a botticelli to immortalize someone um perhaps we can still do that as painters if, if we're really, really good, and if we really manage to convey something profound in our work, maybe we can still immortalize a particular individual that we paint. But uh, in our day and age, um, the painting has to amount to a lot more than likeness. Mm. Uh, because that territory was completely taken all over by technology. Um, and maybe, maybe even in the past, before photography was invented, uh, maybe painters had to do more than to capture, capture like, likeness. Um, the, the, uh, the reason we look at uh, portraits by someone like Botticelli is not because uh, we know for a fact that uh, here there is a picture in a museum, and it looks exactly like that particularly that 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 particular member of the Medici family. Hmm. Interesting. So you're saying that basically, with the invention of photography, the core of the crisis was that capturing the likeness used to be the purview of painters we had a kind of monopoly on this uh on this commodity that people were very very interested in and this commodity was hijacked from us by a better yeah. agent uh the, the photographic machine and then Absolutely. Painters, yeah painters had to now that they lost the monopoly on this commodity they they became uh, they had to compete in the market of of, of uh, visual effects and maybe they so how did they respond to that Mm, well, uh, we not necessarily we are not necessarily competing with photography, but but we are challenged by it very very deeply, and uh, I I think that uh, photography uh, really made it very clear that a painting, if it is any good, has to be more than uh, a um, lifelike representation. Um, it has to be more than memesis or like replication of reality. Uh, 
Um, and uh, one could assume that uh, painting really transformed and, and has and it, it was pushed out of the, the likeness territory completely. Um, we could still engage in that, but, uh, but um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but, uh, but we have to do way more. Um, uh, other, otherwise we will be as dead as rotary phones. Um, now, uh, for, I think that photography has done us a good, a great service. Mm. Uh, it 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 uh, made it made us lose a lot of the market, but <laughs> <laughs> but but there there was a tremendous amount of service that photography has uh, uh, given us. I think because it 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 showed very very clearly that uh, painting is more than. A, rep a replication. It's more than mimesis. And we still look at Botticelli, we still still look at Titian, we could care less whether uh, these were the exact features or the exact proportions of the people they portrayed. And we can now afford to disconnect like uh, likeness from expressiveness or mm. likeness, uh, life likeness from aliveness. Mm. And if we manage uh, to make our paintings alive in one way or another, we uh, have a very, very good chance to uh, stay relevant and um, not necessarily compete with photography, but to, um, to uh, uh, retain for ourselves a really profound territory, which is not necessarily occupied by any technology. Mm, and uh, wow, you said so much interesting uh, stuff there that I'm trying to think how to how to how to structure this. Maybe first elaborate a little bit. You said mimesis is no longer enough. We have to do more. What is that more? Um, very good question. Uh, this is for us to decide for ourselves and to discover. Uh, painting can do many things, in my opinion. Um, and it really depends on the painter. That's the beauty of painting. So, for example, uh, uh, just 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 for the audience to um, to be clear, if some if not if some may want uh, an elaboration of the, in, of the, uh, on the term, mimesis is a Greek term uh, which was used specifically to describe the visual arts, and it basically it means. Uh, a uh, replication of uh, reality. No, I mean, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry if, uh, I apologize to those whose ancient Greek is way better than mine. Um, and uh, like we in the West or in the in the post Renaissance, in the Renaissance and post Renaissance culture, we've readopted that uh, Greek um, view on the visual arts. So uh, we wanted uh, the sculptures and the paintings to uh, replicate reality in a fairly accurate fashion. And so that's what Memesis meant. But if you look at the uh, Eastern tradition, and I mean e e East Eastern Christian tradition, uh, there are those marvelous icon paintings. They don't try to replicate reality in any way. Uh, and they are not challenged by photography at all. And they occupy a particular uh, cultural niche. Um, and uh, so some of us may want to look at those icon paintings for whatever experience. And uh, a paint, like a portrait painter like Giacometti uh, occupies a rather different cultural niche. Uh, so and both a Giacometti and uh, an orthodox icon for us, or there, there are both paintings uh, as far as you know, as, as far as we agree on this terminology, uh, but they express rather different things. Um, so, so it's really uh, there is a tremendous amount of flexibility inherent in the material. We can lead it in many different directions, uh, away from mimesis. We can also retain mimesis and do more. Mm. I think there is wow. There's so much to go on here. First of all, you brought ancient Greece into the mix. And if I recall, correct me if I'm wrong on this, I think that when Plato was talking about my, uh, mimesis, he was actually pretty down on it. He, it was almost like a derogatory term because for him, you know, philosophy and poetry were much higher arts. And then he would say, you know, artists are so occupied 
with mimesis. Uh, they're just copying what's out there, but they're not they're not in touch with anything deeper or more or more profound than the superficial that can be uh, seen. So perhaps the the death of painting uh, due to the accusation that mimesis is unnecessary is actually an older thing that than than we think. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, uh, uh, Plato was very, very skeptical of artists that, that we know. Um, he wrote in a culture uh, which has which placed a tremendous uh, value and importance uh, on the uh, shoulders of uh, mortal painters. Um, uh, in fact, if 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 uh, if you know, if, if uh, one wanted to be a good painter, maybe ancient Greece was the best time. Uh, painters were highly celebrated. Um, so so um, uh, for Plato, it was a cultural critique. He was, uh, he was, uh, he was way ahead of his time mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in, in, in his criticism of uh, representational painting. And I think that in some ways, Plato's philosophy paved the way um, for icon paintings, which moved away from reality. Interesting. So I think I wanna I wanna take us down to earth for a little bit uh, for people listening, and perhaps offer a few examples so that people can follow along and understand what we're talking about. So uh, this is in this is like my opinion. So feel feel free to uh, disagree or or correct the record. So if we're talking about the early days of photography, and we we look at painters who who did dabble or focus on portraiture, and we're asking ourselves, what can we do that is more than mimesis? What are we gonna do that is not just plain representation? And I think these things are already starting to happen with, uh, with people like Sargent, in my opinion, because Sargent uh, objects basically with, with the style that he developed, right? It's nothing like Jacques-Louis David or Eng or all these people who are trying to polish everything and basically remove the fingerprint of the artist from the craft. Sargent comes and says, hold on a second, I can do both mimesis and simultaneously add a very, very heavy-handed layer of self-expression into the mix. So with every brushstroke that I'm going to put on the surface, I'm going to leave it visible, unpolished, and on purpose, such that we are getting the mimesis that one can expect from photography, plus the expressive nature of the calligraphy uh, that, that leaves the artist's hand as a major part of the piece. That would be one way of looking at it. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I, I think that Sargent was uh, following the footsteps of uh, somewhat earlier masters like Manet, mm. um, a, who... Uh, uh, who was quite um, rough uh, for his time with the with the paintbrush? He was very very calligraphic uh, with it, with his paint, and um, he was definitely responding to um, uh, to the invention of photography, whether consciously or subconsciously. And uh, it's also interesting that the around the times of Manet, the and definitely in the times of Sargent. Uh, Painters' preferences have shifted. So, uh, so uh, let's say, uh, if uh, um, you know, the more conservative preference uh, at the at the time of Manet would be someone like Jacques Louis David uh, or Raphael, then um, uh, more avant-garde painters um, went back to look at Titian, Velasquez, and Franz Hals who have manifested this really, really powerful sensitivity to the, uh, to the nature of the painting material mm. and the nature of the human touch, um, which, uh, which was kind of uh, taken out uh, of the more neoclassical approaches. Um, so, so yes, painters like Manet, painters like uh, Sargent, the Impressionists, they, they said, well, uh, uh, let, let's uh, let's let's get crazy with the brushwork. Let's get uh, crazy with uh, color, um, and uh, and uh, so they, they they were responding to the contemporary situation. They think they were responding to photography and a bunch of other uh, inventions of the time and then the cultural shifts. And they were at the same time they were looking at the past. And they were fishing out of the past exactly what 
they needed and that what they were interested in more uh, than uh, someone like uh, Jacques Louis Davy. Mm, so that's beautifully, beautifully put. So uh, just to kind of do a quick summary, uh, at the time of like in the 19th century, when we're talking about people like Jacques Louis David, Ankh, Bougaro, it's, uh, it's considered of very high value when a painter is able to completely extract any trace of his hand from the piece. You know, in the piece, uh, pieces by Bougaro, you don't really see a lot of brushwork. You don't really see a lot of uh, the fingerprint of the artist present in the piece. Uh, and that leads to a kind of timeless look uh, as if the, you know, if you look at Raphael, it's like he put his, the pigments on his hand and just, you know, blew them onto the canvas. There's like no sign of human touch. Uh, and when, the, when photography arrived and basically uh, hijacked the, the appeal um, and, uh, and took over the, 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 aesthetic, the aesthetic convention of making a polished uh, um, image that doesn't contain the fingerprint of paint, then painters look back in history and they say, okay, okay, maybe there's another way. Maybe there's another way. And they're looking at painters like Franz Haus, Velasquez, Rembrandt, uh, these people and say, okay, maybe we take this uh, calligraphic approach that, that brings uh, paint into the foreground and, uh, and maybe that way we can do it. So essentially, in simple terms, Sargent comes along and says, oh, you think painting's dead? Hold my beer. I'll show you what, what photography can't do. I'm going to show you uh, how to make a kind of image that photography is never going to be able to do. Um, and I think, and you brought, uh, you brought the impressionists into the mix, maybe say a word or two about how they did it, because they did it in a slightly different way than Sargent. Yes, they, they were uh, uh, working before the invention of color photography. And uh, they, uh, they said, okay, we're not going to paint the uh, landscape in a um, journalistic fashion. Uh, we are more interested, we're most interested in things that uh, only we as painters can do, and we will respond to things uh, that at the moment only we can do, is, uh, only we as painters can respond to, and we will do it in our unique way. So with Impressionism, uh, you, uh, uh, we have this explosion of color. Uh, which obviously photography at that time couldn't compete with. And uh, like with uh, all the guys that we mentioned so far, uh, the brushwork was released. The uh, brushwork gained an independence uh, from the object represented. So it's like if you, lo if you look closely at uh, a Monet painting, you, you see dabs of paint. You don't see a cathedral, you don't see a tree. Um, uh, so, so the, these are two, um, uh, two professional manifestations of uniqueness for that mm. time. And uh, there's one more artist that I think I think did this in a in a brilliant way. Perhaps jumping a little bit ahead, but I just I, I think I think he belongs he belongs with these guys with the with the solutions that he came up with a little bit uh, again a little bit later. But uh, I think Klimt came up with some brilliant solutions to this uh, also by looking backwards. So when we look at Klimt's painting, we see the reoccurrence of a sim symbolism that, that reminds us almost of a medieval uh, way of, of doing things, you know, the introduction of gold leaf, the introduction of, of collage, the introduction of, uh, of flat graphic surfaces that were so common in pre-Renaissance art uh, and of course, you know, photography cannot cannot create these effects. So I think Klimt also had had a, a very, very smart way of, of thinking, OK, what can be done that is exclusive to painting and no no other medium can basically compete. And he brought that uh, to the to the front of the stage in a, in a beautiful way. What do you think about that? Yeah, well, he, he, he was a highly, highly skilled painter. If you look at his early um, portraits, they, they're they're incredible. Uh, in just just in, in terms of sheer skill, um, uh, he moved into a more uh, uh, decorative uh, way mm. of painting. Uh, there's flatting, and there's uh, there's a uh, very very decorative and a rather innovative approach to composition, um, and uh, the the uh, use of of course there is some use of mixed media and so forth and so on. Um, I, I, I think he's, he, he's a designer as much as a painter. Um, 
and then all, 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 all the all, all, all these uh, great painters they have to uh, keep uh, way after their physical death they have to keep competing with technology and changes they they couldn't even anticipate. Mm. So so we, uh, we in the case of impressionists we have, we we well, well, uh, do we still want to look into impressionist paintings after the invention of color photography. Okay. Uh, do we still want to look at Klimt, uh, even though we see so much incredible design in mm. our lives? Uh, and uh, we're surrounded by color and we're surrounded by flashy uh, colors, whether gold or pink or silver or whatever. Um, and and, uh, the, and the, this, is, this, this is how paintings keep getting tested by our cultural and technological changes and uh, if we uh, if we still look at a Monet for uh, some reasons other than be just because he's a famous painter then it's a good sign it means that painting has something unique uh, which it retains through through the ages beautiful so to sum up middle of the middle early middle of the 19th century photography comes to the uh ar arrives on the scene hijacks mimesis from painters people proclaim painting is dead painters retaliate by saying whoa whoa we're not only about mimesis we got other stuff to offer and painting you know tries tries to survive but then other assaults were mounted against painting other proclamations were made that painting is dead perhaps from dif for different reasons from different sources maybe you can go into that uh, yeah, pl uh, plenty of reasons for many things to die, and that, that's the history of the 20th century, uh, the um, uh, cultural and the sociological changes of the uh, two great wars. Mm. In, uh, uh, World, World, uh, World War I, the entire society disintegrates, and um, uh, the, the entire social fabric uh, which painting was a practical part of, and, uh, and then, then uh, creative individuals uh, begin to ask themselves, well, uh, are we still here to make uh, pretty pictures that uh, rich people will put on the wall? And uh, what's the point? There, there was a very uh, nihilistic uh, moment in uh, the human history. And that's how the... Um, uh, Dada movement came about. Um, it was a highly, highly creative uh, moment in the European cultural history. Also very, very destructive. Um, uh, and it, it presented uh, tremendous challenges to painting. Um, it uh, gave a somewhat, the Dada movement gave a premature birth to uh, performance art, to conceptual art and so forth and so on. These are all challenges to what we do with a paintbrush. Um, at the same time, uh, within the same data movement, there were incredible uh, innovations with uh, collage, with uh, uh, more intuitive uh, approaches to handling paint. And uh, these, uh, these uh, ideas and uh, novelties are still uh, with us. Hmm. I want to go a little bit before the wars. So there's, an, there's a very interesting moment in European painting uh, when futurism happens in Italy. So these, these futurist painters, uh, they basically, in a way, harness painting in, in service of the war machine in service of, of the, some of them end up, you know, joining the, the military, joining the war effort. Uh, and, and this is this is a very strange place for painting to be. There is like a kind of merger between uh, painting and, and propaganda, and 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 they had a manifesto, which is something that I don't think previous art movements were were fond of really. So there's there's this like collectivization of painting that happens that I think takes take it away from the indiv individualistic nature that it that it used to have up until that point and. And furthermore, these, these futurists, they say in their manifesto, we're here to burn the museums. We're here, to, <laughs> we're here to burn the libraries. You know, the old painting, if it's not dead, 
if it's just dying, then we better deliver the final blow. Maybe you can say a little bit about how we got to that point. All righty. That's a very, very uh, broad subject. Uh, one day we may want to discuss just that. Uh. <laughs> uh, uh, personally, just, just to be clear uh, and um, uh, to be very, very upfront, uh, personally, I'm not a fan of the futurist movement for a bunch of reasons. Uh, there were some fantastic futurist painters uh, or painters who evolved out of futurism. For example, I love Mario Cironi, um, but I'm not uh, that fond of the uh, movement itself. Um, they did aim to make paintings. They aimed to make sculptures. Uh, but unlike um, uh, paintings, uh, unlike the Impressionist painters, or even unlike there are some contemporaneous uh, early 19th century, uh, sorry, early 20th century movements, they uh, were very, very uh, rational about what they want to do. And they were trying to compete with the new technology. They didn't try, they didn't necessarily try to find, rediscover the unique aspects, the unique qualities inherent so only in the painting medium, they try to use the painting medium to compete uh, and to glorify the technology uh, that they witnessed in their life. So they, 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 uh, they glorified the machine and uh, they had uh, these uh, uh, mechanical uh, monstrosities uh, influence their work they uh, tried to um, uh, do what cinema does. They tried to replicate movement uh, through the medium of painting. Now, uh, from, uh, from today's point of view, at least in my opinion, uh, the way the futurists try to express movement is slightly naive. Mm. Uh, it's it's, it's, uh, it's uh, maybe even ridiculous. <laughs> uh, 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 why am I saying? Well, and I, I think it's because they were too influenced by uh, technology in the wrong way. Uh, they tried to compete with stuff that paint, painting doesn't have to compete with. Um, Say more about and, that. Yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe we can compare the futures to someone to some other work of that time. Let's say, uh, um, let's say. Um, uh, even the surrealists. Mm. Uh, so, so the, the, the surrealists, they, they didn't really try to uh, make their paintings look like photographs, like cinema or like um, cars. Uh, they, uh, they used painting as a medium to, um, uh, to dive into subconsciousness. And they developed all these very, very interesting approaches to painting, like automatic painting. Uh, which is something that uh, Max Ernst uh, mm -hmm. practiced uh, throughout his career in combination with, uh, with uh, more uh, cerebral approaches. He was a fascinating painter. Um, uh, and he, he combined accidents with planning in a very, very creative way. Um, but but he, he, he's truly a painter, I think. He's, he's doing something that the painting medium does well for him. Mm. Oh, I love that. Maybe you tell me if you agree with this uh, very broad summary that painters, uh, due to in part the crisis of the crisis of mimesis, which is something I, th I think we can use that the crisis of mimesis, were pushed towards uh, finding ways to create images that cannot be cannot be accomplished uh, through mechanical means. So if this starts with people like Sargent and and the Impressionists, which we still recognize as being close to representational art, it travels through stages of like Fubism with great painters like Bonnard. And uh, then we get to painters like Matisse. They're pushing away and uh, more farther and farther away from the necessity to lean on mimesis. And they're finding other things that perhaps can make a painting strong, regardless of whether or not it's trying to perfectly stick to how reality looks like and instead actually use painting as a medium to look inwards and express what's inside, which of course photo photographers cannot yet do, cannot yet tell us about what's going on inside of the human heart, 
So painters were kind of getting drunk on color and expressiveness uh, to bring, you know, very interesting things uh, to the world of visual arts. Absolutely, absolutely. It was, uh, uh, it was a great moment for uh, different types of expression um, as opposed to uh, uh, the same old type of uh, representation and replication. And I think that if you if you read Matisse's writings, he he didn't think that painting was dead. It wasn't. It was. It didn't look like he was living in a moment of crisis because he was writing about painting as if it is. It is understood that painting is alive. So from from Matisse's point of view, there's been a challenge that was mounted against painting in the mid 19th century. Then the challenge was accepted. Hold my beer. The painters found a way out. Painting was alive again. And then the wars happen, and then perhaps tell us where 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 are painters uh, psychologically after the after the after the wars? What are they doing? What are they thinking? Well, uh, they are all over the place. Um, just an interesting historical fact: uh, in World War One, painters were still sent to the battlefield to document the war. It was like it it was like this last. Um, atavism of the uh, of the old old world, and 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 of course uh, that was pretty much the end of it. Um, <clears throat> uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, painters were uh, other painters who were not uh, 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 who, who were not enjoying uh, being employed in the army. Uh, <laughs> as, <laughs> Uh, they, they, they. Uh, I mean, they, they, they were sensitive to the, uh, to the, to the horrors that uh, the um, uh, the uh, society was going through, and uh, some of them really questioned uh, the the uh, the meaning of discipline itself. So, and 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 perhaps you know, you said you said army uh, painter serving in the army, uh, which brings to mind to me at least uh, Kirchner, right? And we're thinking about all those all those German. German Expressionism, uh, these these paintings, you know, there's a famous uh, self-portrait by Kirchner where he's uh, he's painting himself with like bandages or or something like that as um, w- wounded from the war, and those those German Expressionism paintings look look nothing <laughs> look nothing like they're focused on mimesis. We're we're so far past mimesis. Uh, perhaps you can you can tell us a little bit how how we got to that kind of style. What are they trying to do? Uh, well, um, I'm, I'm not a big expert on Kirchner, uh, but I, I think that uh, they were trying to use the uh, medium of painting to express uh, whatever they wanted to express, uh, as opposed to impress. Mm. Uh, uh, they, they were no longer interested in uh, uh, in um, bragging about how well they can paint. Uh, they wanted to use the medium of painting to uh, really say something about uh, the human condition, their perhaps their personal condition, and perhaps about uh, about the medium itself, uh, which um, does not always want to be as pristine and as neutral. As uh, uh, as it looks in neoclassical work. Wow, I I must admit I've never thought about it that way, and I think I think that's brilliant. The painters feeling perhaps for the first time that their work is not meant to impress. I think listeners should actually let that sink because that's that's huge. That's huge, and I think you're totally spot on about this when we're looking at when we're looking at these. Uh, these German Expressionist paintings, they almost look like excerpts from a diary, right? They look like something that is almost done for the sake of themselves as a form of uh, semi-therapy. These are people who are expressing uh, what's in the deepest parts of their souls, uh, perhaps at the expense of making these paintings uh, accessible to others or impressive to others, or li- they, don't, they don't aim to lift the spirit uh, mm-hmm. or, or to be attractive in any way. They aim to be evocative and to become objects that are vessels for a very unique kind of pain, a human experience that ends up being conveyed to the observers. I think that's that's incredibly sharp and, and very important. 
And at the same time, kind of directly after the, again, before we get to data, I'm like saving data. Uh, maybe we can say a little bit about uh, the American expressionism, which went in a totally different direction in the 50s, abstract expressionism. What's up with that? Oh, that, 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 that comes, uh, that comes uh, somewhat later. So uh, we're talking about like, let's say 40s and 50s. Uh, about, uh, let's say, uh, some 25, 30 years after the Dada movement. Um, uh, to me, that, that, that was a fantastic uh, moment in uh, the history of art. Um, it, took me, uh, it took me some time to really appreciate, to adopt uh, the American uh, abstract ex expressionism as uh, one of my... Uh, influences one of my uh, revered uh, moments in uh, cultural history. Um, well, it, it, it's uh, like, like any, any great moment, there is a tremendous amount div uh, of diversity. So, mm. so one can't really talk about the movement itself because there is no such movement. Mm. Um, uh, all, all these uh, gigantic individuals are very, very different from each other. As painters, um, uh, the uh, one thing that the uh, movement, uh, that, like one thing that the expression, the abstract expressionist painters emphasize, perhaps as a group, is that painting is a process. Uh, and uh, in, when we started the conversation, we defined what death means in the context of our conversation, but we did we didn't really speak about what painting means in the context of our conversation. Mm. Um, and usually, usually we speak about paintings and we mean objects. Like we, we, we speak about the painting on the wall, the painting in the museum or paintings in the museum. Uh, now painting is in the English language is a noun and a verb. Uh, and uh, these uh, great American painters have uh, truly managed to emphasize and clarify and uh, perpetuate the idea that painting is a process. Mm, beautiful. So we're talking about we're talking about painters like Rothko, whom I I love, and pain, painters like Pollock, whom I love less. But uh, just to explain, I think Pollock is a great example to explain what you just said. So for Pollock, the fact that he drips the paint directly onto the canvas, he makes, he makes the, the painting noun inseparable from the painting verb because the process of making that painting, the dripping, the dancing, the, the movement becomes actually the, the main issue, the main issue at hand. Uh, uh, such a significant part of the piece uh, is actually making the viewer understand the process that uh, brought this painting into existence. That's spot on. And uh, in, in the case of Pollock, it's really ex extreme because they, they, the canvas is on the floor and uh, mm -hmm. uh, the artist is dancing around it or maybe on it, dripping paint, as we all know. But uh, also when the canvases are uh, positioned uh, in a traditional uh, vertical uh, way and uh, let's say like well like with a rough core de Kooning um, uh, the process is there and and um, and uh, also with the de Kooning the the process inseparable from the object itself so I think you, you said something really interesting that uh, I'd feel bad if I didn't ask you about you said that abstract expressionism didn't used to be your favorite but you've learned to appreciate it Maybe take us a little bit on that journey, because I'm sure many people listening to us have seen Rothko and they say, what do you mean you like him, Ken? This is just like rectangles of color. I don't understand how you could come to appreciate him, but Rothko is one of my favorite painters. And if you went through that process, maybe you can bring others along with you. Wow. Okay. My 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 uh, journey was uh, first and foremost ge uh, geographic. I was born in uh, St. Petersburg and uh, my... Uh, 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 my uh, native museum, if one can say this way, is the Hermitage, which mm. is a very, very uh, conservative institution, maybe less so nowadays, but it was uh, very, very conservative when I was growing up. And uh, I, th I think the uh, most uh, 
novel and the uh, the most modern paintings I uh, saw as a child were maybe uh, cubist uh, cubist works by uh, Picasso and Brock. Um, that's as far uh, as it got, but uh, there were plenty of beautiful Poussins and uh, Claude's, uh, Claude landscapes and Chardin's and so forth and so on. So, so that, 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 that was the world, that was the uh, cu um, uh, cultural world I grew up in, that, that, was my, that, that was the foundation of my visual culture. And uh, then when I, when, I, when I came to the United States to study um, a few years later, uh, it, it, it was a tremendous shock to me to see the American museums. Uh, yes, I could. I went to the Frick collection and I saw the old masters in the Metropolitan, uh, but I couldn't avoid and I did not want to avoid uh, looking at these uh, enormous inexplicable canvases. And I was really trying to figure them out for myself. Uh, and and, uh, and it, it took some time. It's, it's, it's a very subtle process, uh, just looking at strange things again and again and again, and uh, uh, not being impressed by the technique. Um, uh, over a course of quite a few experiences of looking at these pictures at these um at these i don't know entities one could say uh i asking myself well am i getting impressed by something is there uh what uh is uh, because we were talking we were talking about the uh expressing as opposed to impressing well the paintings don't aim to impress but i was asking myself can they impress me in one way or another Hmm. And uh, uh, the more I was getting immersed in this unusual uh, visual culture, unusual for me, um, uh, the more I, uh, uh, the more meaning I found in it. Interesting. I think we can. I think we can expand on that in another podcast. This is fascinating. <laughs> so okay. So now I'm going to go back in the timeline to to Dada, and I'm just going to kind of try to tie a bow around this. So we've 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 looked at two different kinds of death that I think are circumstantial. Uh, death by external means, right? Death by photography, death by war. Now with Dada, we have something pretty different. We're starting to get into death by ideology, death by philosophy, death by, death by different things. So maybe talk to us a little bit about what's going on there with Dada. I think looking back at the Dada movement, it, 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 was, uh, it was a psychological crisis. Uh, it wasn't so much, I, most uh, Dada uh, artists, most da or, or, or Dada creators, uh, they, they weren't ideology driven. Um, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but then ideology kicked in after the fact. Um, so so, so the, the, uh, the, the world of art had to figure out how to digest all these novel uh, movements, all these novel uh, discoveries in uh, within in no novel uses of the visual language, and uh, and uh, there is the side of the of the painters or the creative individuals who try to do to make some to make objects, whether paintings or collages or sculptures, and then uh, there is the uh, uh, the uh, recipient, the viewer, the uh, the structure of the art world, the critic, and uh, and so forth and so on. So. Uh, so you know, uh, critics are artists of who use words, and uh, words uh, are very, very different from uh, paint. And um, and there are many ideas that uh, are expressed better in words and expressed less through paint. And uh, those who use words would more easily adopt ideas that um, that words accommodate well. So I'll, I'll make myself clear. It was a little bit confusing. Um, so for, 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 for an artist of words, let's say an art critic, uh, it is much more natural to uh, discuss painting strictly within its um, historical context and much more easy to proclaim the death of painting. It's much easier for the critic 
to say that painting is meaningless than it is for a painter who is um, um, deeply infatuated with uh, the paint brushes and the, and the palette and, uh, and the uh, blobs of paint on the canvas. Hmm. So maybe, maybe we can take it even more concretely. Uh, so drawing the mustache on a Mona Lisa, right? Drawing the mustache on the, on the Mona Lisa. What kind of mm -hmm. statement is that? That's a kind of shot in the head painting. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. all this like old master revered Leonardo da Vinci. Along come the Dada movement and they say, we put a mustache on this. This is all a clown show. What do they mean to say? Uh, I don't know. I think, I, think it's I think it's better to read the writings of Marcel Duchamp. Mm. Um, I can't, I, 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 he, he, he was, uh, he was a very, very smart guy. He was a good writer. Uh, he was a good speaker. I, I wouldn't take upon myself the responsibility to, uh, uh speak on his behalf. Uh, one thing I can say is that, um, well, he, as an intellectual, uh, as a smart guy, he was somewhere, um, in between the, uh, the territory of the visual artist and the territory of the art critic. And, uh, and of course, to an art critic, a guy like uh, Marcel Duchamp is a lot more palatable uh, um, than, uh, than um, a more conservative painter who, is, uh, using, uh, who, who still wants to use uh, very old fashioned materials. Mm. I think, uh, you tell me what you think about that. In my opinion, Uh, the Dada movement has a very uh, strong engine running underneath, whether explicitly or, or not explicitly, of iconoclasm. There's, there's, uh, I think uh, during that time in human history, there's a lot of feeling like some people are in power at the top. They're leading us in dreadful directions, including world wars, right? They're, they're pushing us uh, in directions that are societally extraordinarily harmful. And this, this generates a kind of a philosophical uh, uprising, right? That goes against the power structure. This thing against the mm -hmm. power structure, against the power structure is something that we still hear today in postmodernist philosophy. This is a key issue, how to mm -hmm. undermine the power structure, how to replace the power structure. And to me, uh, this act of putting the mustache on the Mona Lisa is a bit, is a kind of iconoclasm. By iconoclasm people, I mean uh, icon, right? And clasm means like destruction. The destruction of icons is to take the, the dominant power structure, the dominant heroes of the culture or the dominant uh, forces at play, you could say, and subvert them, turn them against themselves or ruin them in some sense. So I think that, that that's how I take that statement by, uh, by drawing the mustache on the Mona Lisa. It's, uh, it's almost like, poking the eye, right? Of like, all you guys who are on top will get you from the bottom one day. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And it's a very, very interesting direction for our discussion. I, I, I didn't uh, really examine the question of Dadaism from that standpoint, but you're absolutely correct. Dadaism is the premature birth of postmodernism, mm -hmm. which evolves uh, in its present, uh, in, in, in its more... Um, Uh, mature form way later, but but that that's that's the origin of postmodernism, um, and uh, yes, they were they were questioning the structure of society, and uh, the and since painting was the privilege of the privileged, exactly, exactly. Uh, then then uh, yes, let's let let's rip that apart. Exactly. Um, so so that's that's what I meant when I said death by ideology, because I think. Uh, there's a lot to Renaissance painting and, and, and high art from the Baroque or all that stuff that is intrinsically associated with high society, rich people, people who don't really care about the lower classes, people who live in castles, people who can afford all those magnificent uh, oil paintings that take years to produce. And along come Dada and say, that stuff's dead. That stuff's dead. And you know why it's dead? It's dead because it's... Uh, egocentric because it's a high society activity. It's rotten to the core because it just shows you what rich people do with all their money. And you know what's fit for the public? What's fit for the public is things that we can print, 
things that we can disseminate. Uh, we can have uh, these little leaflets, these little booklets, uh, everything that's reproducible. And it's, it's, it's a way of killing painting by ideology, by making it associated with, uh, with the kind of rich people that, uh, that weren't very much in fashion back then and still aren't very much in fashion today. Uh, yes, that, that's a uh, the, uh, very, very eloquent uh, way of describing the ideology that started to gradually evolve uh, around the First World War. Uh, but um, uh, painting is painting and ideology is, and is ideology. Uh, uh, p uh, ide no ideology can uh, go past the surface of painting. And by surface, I mean it's uh, historical, um, it's it's uh, it, it's uh, historical circumstances. So uh, there is a famous book. I think what, what's what well, what is it called? The uh, uh, Ways of Seeing, I believe. Burger, I think, or something like that. Right, Burger. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So so that 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 was uh, that that was a, a rather influential text, uh, which. Um, analyzes, among other things, analyzes uh, Baroque portrait paintings from a cultural standpoint. And not only analyzes Baroque painting from a cultural stand standpoint, it, it, it analyzes um, the, uh, the, the Baroque paintings from the cultural standpoint of the 20th century. Uh, so, so, uh, so, so basically, the, it, 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 uh, uh, the, the author is describing, if I remember correctly, the author is describing paintings as representation of, uh, of the social structure. Mm. Okay. And my question, really? That's <laughs> what painting is to you? <laughs> this is, uh, painting is just that? Maybe we should really look at paintings. <laughs> mm. <laughs> okay, that that that's good. So we have we have several kinds of death outlines and and uh, the kind of historical resistance that was uh, mounted against these accusations. Uh, there's a ma another major technological advancement that was done uh, uh, during the 20th century, which influenced visual arts a lot. Maybe you can talk a little bit about film. Oh, uh, I can only talk a little bit about film because I don't know that much. Uh, but uh, like, like with photography, film was first influenced by painting. Uh, so if, if we go back to daguerreotypes, uh, the, the first uh, photographic portraits were staged as anger paintings. And uh, films, early films, responded to uh, the uh, visual com structures, compositions that were familiar to the creators from their visits to the museums. Mm. Uh, so, so film was, still is, I think, is highly influenced by the art of painting. Uh, but uh, nothing works one way in, uh, in our culture. Uh, film had also, uh, also had a tremendous impact on painting itself. So if we, uh, so it's, 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 it's like, um, imagine that, let's say you, 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 you give birth to a child and the child be, be develops a character of its own and then you are influenced by that ind new individuality that uh, evolves out of your gene pool. Uh, so film is uh, you know, it's an absolutely new technology, but it, it grows out of the visual culture that uh, we all want to be a part of. And obviously it affects the visual culture uh, through its uh, unique features. So uh, let's say painters like um, uh, Hopper, mm. uh, uh, he painted theaters uh, where they would show films. But he didn't only paint, uh, he didn't only turn film into his subject matter, he was also influenced by the aesthetic of, uh, of the movies of his, of his time. Uh, and there, there was a very, very interesting back and forth. Uh, it's like uh, the early movies were, were influenced by the uh, visual culture that comes from the more traditional uh, media, and then uh, artists were influenced by film, and, uh, and film was again influenced by those new artists and it's 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 a very very interesting loop um i think as, as as long as we don't try to compete 
uh, with the film, which would be a very, very stupid uh, idea, uh, uh, we are fine. It's no, it's no threat. Uh, it's, it's, uh, for me, it's only inspiration. Beautiful. Uh, so maybe now we can get to postmodernism. So postmodernism, uh, which uh, we've, uh, we've established, uh, develop is like a late development of, of, uh, of ideas that kind of uh, came into being in the, in the data. Uh, and that brings with it a whole series <laughs> of things that we can probably spend the entire podcast, an entire podcast talking about. But perhaps you can, we can focus the conversation about how is postmodernism killing painting or claiming that painting is dead? Oh, uh, postmodernism uh, is so many things. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on, uh, uh, on this uh, condition. It's, I, can't, we can't, I can't call it a movement. It's like it's a cultural condition, um, uh, which has all kinds of symptoms. Um, I think to me more than anything else is it's it is the uh, is the attitude um, mm. because the 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 ironic attitude uh, or the uh, um, it's like it's like if you if you uh, if all ideas and uh, materials and uh, media are equally valid, uh, which, you know, one could say that, that this is the postmodernism ethos, then it's really, really hard to commit wholeheartedly to a given medium. And I think that the um, uh, painting as a, as a verb, as a process, and as an object or as a noun, uh, the, uh, the grows out of a very, very profound and honest relationship with the material. And if it's just one of many materials or if it's just one of many cultural manifestations, uh, and they, uh, in, in, then you know, we'll, we'll, lose, we'll lose that connection to the materials and, uh, and painting uh, uh, experiences the danger of becoming a painted canvas. Mm. which is not the same thing okay so 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 let's say uh let's say uh, uh some works by jeff Koons are done with uh oil paints on canvas right so technically speaking uh they uh, fall squarely in the category of painting but are they really paintings i, I don't know and personally i don't i don't quite think so why not uh, because uh, these uh, particular works, let's let's say the infamous uh, Made in Heaven series with Cicciolina, uh, I think they are painting. At least some of them are, were done with oils on canvas. So, so these days are like uh, blown up uh, photographs uh, of pornographic nature uh, that were. Um, uh, very meticulously uh, painted uh, with oil paints on canvas by assistants. Uh, so, so, so what what is happening there? It's a it's a complete disconnection between the idea and the process, between mm. the idea and the material. There is a an initial idea. There is an original photograph, and then there is the uh, completely irrelevant process of turning this idea and this photograph into a painted canvas. Mm. Now, to me, this is not quite painting. Now, I'm not trying to convince anyone, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, this is my personal view. Why is it not painting? Because it, uh, what remains uh, for, um, is the object itself. The process is not really there. The process is completely irrelevant. I think the most important word that you used in relation to the to, to postmodernism, and this is this is my, my personal take on it, uh, is irony. I think irony is a is a huge driver of uh, of postmodernism, and and it's it basically undermines something that I think is necessary for the life of painting, which is which is a kind of faith. Painting is an act of faith that we can take these absolutely ridiculous, uh, ridiculously simple technologies, right? What is paint? It's, it's, it's colorful glue 
right? It's just a powder inside of a glue. And that's, that's the extent of it. And expect to create something sublime out of it. It's a ridiculous idea. And it requires a lot of faith. And postmodernism, uh, and in general, you know, the 70s, was, was a time of immense skepticism, immense skepticism, and thinking about how things that we thought in the past are not, in fact, what we thought that they were. So a lot of postmodernism uh, artworks deal with taking something that we used to think was elevated and reduce it to the banal. And then on, on, on the other side, taking something that is totally banal and making it compete with high art. So this is, this is both happening simultaneously. So what you're describing is Jeff Koons taking the high art of oil painting and reducing it to pornography. And then on the other side, we have Andy Warhol taking soap boxes, right? Or, or Coke advertisements or Marilyn Monroe, right? And turning those things, those, those, those very low forms of, of visual communication into high art. Uh, so because, because of the ideological framework and the philosophy that is, that is, uh, that is behind it, uh, it just encourages the, the, the discontinuation of the kind of, of, of naive faith that I think is necessary for the production of good painting. Uh, I, I think that faith is a really beautiful world uh, uh, sorry, a beautiful word, and, and it, which opens up uh, a very, very unique world. Um, and within, and if we speak of faith in painting, among other things, it's a faith in uh, the meaningfulness of the material. Mm. So, so as a painter, um, I feel that I delegate a portion of the creative process to the material that I'm using. And I'm letting that material affect myself and affect the process and to affect the final result. Uh, and it's a very, very intimate kind of relationship. So there is no an intimacy and irony. They don't mix very well. They are like, they are like oil and water. Um, uh, it's not that there are some attempts to mix the, to mix them up, but uh, but uh, but you can't be one hundred percent ironic and intimate. And painting requires intimacy with the material. Um, uh, there there are fantastic uh, painters uh, in the postmodernist era, in my opinion. So let, let's 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 say uh, someone a in 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 the uh, in the same years as Warhol, more or less. Um, a, uh, I forgot the name. Okay, uh, it, the name will come back to me. Another one, James Rosenquist. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, yeah, uh, he he has tr uh, he has quite a few postmodernist elements in his work, and he the way the way he uh, he collages different elements, the way he uses uh, images from the uh, pop culture and so forth and so on. But he's a painter, um, and, and a good one at that. And now, who's the other guy I was thinking of? Uh, let me uh, let me check. Well, while while you think about it, I'm gonna say that I think I think your contrast of of intimacy and irony is spot on. It's absolutely brilliant, and I think that that is if you if you are too preoccupied with with irony at the expense of intimacy, that is that is indeed a kind of death to painting because. Um, as you said, there's something about these these uh, postmodernist um, aesthetics, ideals, methodologies that lead towards using painting for uh, statement. Right, the painting becomes secondary to the idea. Right, what Jeff Koons is doing to the painting is the art piece. Right, it's it's thinking about painting as a tool in order to achieve a uh, uh, a, a goal that is more intellectual, an intellectual goal, uh, as opposed to thinking about painting as an intellectual goal in itself. Mm -hmm. mm. The, or, or the, uh, or the uh, to, uh, yes. And what, what, I, what, I, what I'm emphasizing is to, is to, uh, is to view the process of painting as a goal in itself. Exactly. It's like it's not. It's not of huge interest. To, to Jeff Koons 
uh, and also to the to the I would say to some of the hyper realist painters to examine what can be done with paint on canvas. What do these things offer us? This is like when uh, when a trumpet player learns the trumpet, the trumpet player is is very interested in understanding, well, what can this tool give me? Part of what makes a great guitar player is the infatuation with the tool, the guitar, what can be done by using this instrument. And, and I think you're totally right that good painting demands of the practitioner and infatuation with the craft and infatuation with the materials themselves. And when you think of painting as just another form of image making, uh, it, oh, that's it, a it, horrendous it, word. Yeah, it, it, but that's what they reduce it to, wouldn't you say? Uh... Yeah, and that's uh, well. That that that's uh, when 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 if when painting succumbs to ideology, that's uh, that's how it commits suicide. It's not that it's dead necessarily, but but it can definitely commit suicide. So, would you say that we? I mean, I I, I would I would say that to a huge extent, we still live under the shadow of that era, right? Those those uh, those philosophical principles are still very much in the air and and very much in vogue when you when you go to mainstream galleries here in Chelsea and in London and and in Paris and wherever you are but there is at least uh when we perhaps we are biased right but we look at I look at my surroundings I look at your surroundings and I see a lot of uh a lot of um mimetic or semi mimetic or mimetic adjacent painting starting to emerge again. Uh, where do you think that's coming from? Wow. Uh, can, can you be more specific? Can you give me sure, a specific example? Sure. Yeah. So in the, we're talking about the, ri the rise of postmodernism. Uh, a, lot, a huge shadow of doubt is cast on whether or not painting has anything useful to say because the objective, uh, the, the priority right now is for all thinkers and, and, and people who are um, doing any kind of expressive media like filmmakers, artists, dancers, performers, theater, these people should tie their wagon to ideological efforts to subvert uh, power structures, to uh, defend the proletariat, to stick their finger in the eyes of the corrupt politicians and the nouveau riche and all that kind of, of stuff. And in general, why should we even deal with the old uh, style of making paintings? Because that is intrinsically connected to patriarchy and, and to oppression and even to, to concepts like colonialism. All those things are so embedded with the old craft of, of making these old school oil paintings that by even bringing them back, you would be reviving the horrors of history and aligning yourself with the bad guys. So we shouldn't be doing all of that. We should instead be doing performance art and, and sub subversive film in order to show uh, the elements of society such that we open people's eyes to awaken to the horrendous reality uh, under, of oppression under which we live uh, and, and, you know, start the revolution. It's our job as artists not to be busy making objects for rich people, but instead uh, supporting, supporting the lower classes. And, and, and despite all of that, a lot of artists, uh, no matter where they fall on the political spectrum today, still busy themselves making these big oil paintings that look like stuff you know, that are representational, uh, you know, despite all this very persuasive uh, argumentation mm -hmm. from the side, levied by the side of the critical theorists and the postmodernists. So how are mm -hmm. we, how are we justifying what we're doing? Uh, I think that to me, trying to justify what I'm doing uh, would uh, equate to uh, accepting defeat. Mm. I'm not interested in justifying what I'm doing. Because uh, because uh, I'm uh, not particularly taking the attacks very seriously. Okay. Why aren't they uh, serious? No, they, they are very very serious. Uh, but um, but let me treat irony with irony. Mm. 
Okay, so 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 uh, I mean the 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 speech you gave was uh, quite impressive. I mean it was it was so inspiring. I was uh, uh, I was about to uh, take my red flag out of the closet and uh, march for the proletariat. Uh, and 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 if 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 and if I uh, manage to sell it as a uh, as a work of performance art, I would very much hope it will be purchased for a uh, nice amount of dollars, uh, <clears throat> uh, not by the proletariat itself, of course. Um, uh, so, 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 so all, 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 all these uh, ideologies that you beautifully described, um, uh, uh, they're there. Uh, they are some, they, they may be interesting, but, uh, but, uh, but the. Um, but they're also very, the, uh, some can be interesting, some can be very, very boring. They are utterly useless for the development of painting itself. Um, uh, there, uh, it's uh, it's it's uh, like if you, if you if you wanted to stage uh, a play in or uh, to to make film in uh, Soviet Russia, you had to find at least some connection to Lenin or Marx. Okay, and then and, and then if you found that connection. You um, uh, you got uh, you got the green light, and you could make a beautiful artistic film or a play. Uh, uh, but but you you need to, you need to find the excuse to get the funds. Now I managed to get the funds to make my paintings anyway. So uh, why uh, why uh, play that game? Mm. I'm gonna put my two cents into into this. Uh, so for me, there's a, there's a fundamental error in the, in the logic that, uh, that is, that, that I, uh, that I tried to, to express before, uh, which is if, uh, if rich, if all, if, if this kind of stuff is associated with the rich and that's, uh, that's like a symbol of, of high status. Well, back in the day, running water was a symbol of the rich. So should we stop with running water? Because only rich people used to have it. No, the idea is to bring it to everybody. So if there is something that is a commodity and is a commodity that used to be sold for ridiculous amounts of money, it is because there is some intrinsic value to it. And if the rich people wanted to buy all these gorgeous oil painting, maybe it's because it elevates the human spirit in a way that only a very beautiful oil painting can. I believe in the intrinsic value of beauty. And I don't believe that if something used to be the purview of the rich, we need to eliminate it from society. It is actually our goal to bring it to a wider spectrum of society. So it's not about stopping to do it. It's about doing more of it and doing it in a mm -hmm. way that is perhaps more accessible to the masses. So maybe not everybody can afford to buy my oil painting or your oil painting, but I am very busy using mediums like uh, social media, right, to bring the process of painting to as many people as, as I can, is to take the stuff that used to be uh, the, the, the land of the elite and democratizing it so that it can become accessible to the maximal number of people. And I believe, again, in the value of beauty, I believe that, uh, again, we're back to Plato, right? I believe that beauty is a fundamental virtue and that when confronted with something beautiful, uh, it has a healing effect on us. It it relaxes the soul in a way that I don't think other other things can. When you are confronted with something that is so shockingly beautiful, uh, you can't you can't replace that feeling. And I feel like this is a feeling that uh, again here I'm stepping into biology where I am not an expert. But if you're a biologist listening to this, feel free to come on the podcast and correct the record. But I think this is something that human beings have displayed a need for from the dawn of time. You know, decoration. Uh, changing our environment such they are more fit to become a home for us. This is something that Roger Scruton wrote a lot about in, 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 in very clarifying and beautiful ways. And I think this is the job of artists, to design our environment so that we can feel at home and that our spirit can be lifted. It is not our job, I would say, to only focus on changing the social structure because, hey, guess what? Other people can do it better. Philosophers can do it better. Uh, people who write these ideological books do a better job than what I could do with a painting, most likely. But what I could do with a painting that they cannot do with their ideological books is lift the human spirit by pursuing beauty. And this is the responsibility that only visual artists can take care of. And if we abdicate this responsibility, 
society will all be all the more sick for it. Oh my God, I can't add too much to that. Uh, well, well I, 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 I doubt I can say anything uh, profound enough after this speech. Uh, no, I'm, 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 I'm being absolutely serious. Um, uh, you see, I, 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 uh, I would, it would be a horrendous idea for me to live in a world which is run by artists. Mm -hmm. I don't want artists to make political decisions. Except for me. Uh, <laughs> except for you, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well, yes, you, you, you're, you're, you're one of the very few responsible artists I know. <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, uh, my apologies to all my other artist friends. <laughs> um, uh, yes, yeah, so, so we we, uh, we 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 tend to be all over the place. We uh, we are not necessarily the most rational and the recent the most responsible types, and um, and it's not our job to start uh, revolutions. Um, it's uh, n and it's uh, it's not our job to uh, show. Uh, to, to to criticize society, I don't think I don't think that's the painter's job. Uh, we can do that. I mean, it's 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 not a no no, but it, but it's not our main uh, forte. Um, what uh, we can do is 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 we we can help uh, ourselves make sense of the world, and we can help others make sense of the world through the works of art if they turn out any good mm. um, um, and by making sense of the world i also include the viewer himself or herself okay so we are every one of us is at the center of our personal world and good painting can clarify what's within good painting can clarify what's without um, uh, this is what we can do if we um, if we uh, absorb the traditions well enough if we struggle um, forthrightly through our uh, professional dilemmas professional uh, professional uh, doubts uh, and uh, professional challenges. Uh, and of course, human challenges are involved in that as well. Uh, why am I painting? Uh, am I trying to impress or to express? Yeah, now, now, now uh, going back to, uh, to uh, uh, the uh, role of the artist as a rev uh, revolutionary. Well, if that helps your career, by all means, but, uh, but let's be honest. Why are we looking at works of art? Okay, are do we go to a museum to look at a uh, to, to look at a Rembrandt because he was so revolutionary? No, he was a portrait painter like any other. He was uh, he, uh, he 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 was uh, not so humble guy trying to make a living. Um, uh it, it was his job and yes he was participating in the social structure but what does the social structure have to do with uh the expressiveness of those canvases mm. yeah i think i think uh to me this is this is an intersection that interests me a ton you know the the relationship between social criticism uh, and visual arts. And I, I, I actually wrote quite a few papers on it when I was in university. I was focused on Thomas Nast, on Goya, and, uh, and on Daumier, that I think mm -hmm. were, were unique artists in history that, that managed to both be fantastic artists and be fantastic uh, social, social critics. But they are, they are rare. They are rare and few. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe that would be that would that could be the topic of another conversation. But I think I think we've <laughs> I think we've said <laughs> enough about the death of paintings. So Ilya, maybe maybe tell people where they can find you. Um, I can be found in Tel Aviv physically. <laughs> <laughs> and and by by the way, just 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 to wrap up, just to wrap one last idea to wrap up our conversation about the death of painting. Um, um, 
I can be uh, found on uh, Facebook, of course, but and and we are now talking in Zoom. Uh, but uh, when you come to Tel Aviv, I have no doubt we would be very interested in seeing each other in person. So, so, uh, and what do I mean by that? The uh, technology is wonderful, but it does not uh, conquer all of human territories. Mm. And one of those, so, so physical contact, and I mean the, 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 the seeing each other in a, in a coffee shop, seeing each other in a park uh, has a very, very profound meaning that uh, cannot be taken over by Zoom or by holograms, hmm. okay? And I think painting is the same. It's more like human contact and less so, and, 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 and it's far less similar to iPhones, Zoom, or rotary phones. It's not something that can be replaced by technology if it's profound enough. Of course, of course, there are some parties and some weddings where I want to send my avatar. Mm. Okay, but 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 uh, because because I don't want to be there. Mm. I don't. I'm not interested enough. Now, if we make painting profound enough, it will have a place. Interesting. Oh, I love that thought. That's a beautiful note to end on. All right, Ilya oh. Gefte. <laughs> where, where, where can I be found? Facebook, yes. Instagram, um, uh, website, www.iliagefter.com. Uh, and uh, welcome to uh, my studio or my art school in Tel Aviv. People, I'll put all the links down in the show notes. Make sure that you follow Ilya on Instagram and check out his website. Check out his wares. Uh, it's an important follow. Ilya, thank you so much for taking the time for doing this. I hope to do this again soon. Uh, Ken, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for uh, challenging my thinking and uh, helping me clarify my ideas and uh, hopefully uh, helping me express them in a, uh, in a legible way. Likewise, likewise. Thank you for joining me. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to see it grow, please take a moment to subscribe, rate it highly, and share it with a friend. If you'd like to become a supporter of the show and have access to exclusive content, please consider signing up as a patron at patreon.com slash Ken Goshen. For online lessons, please visit kengoshen.com slash lessons. Thanks again and see you next time.